Hey guys, welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And I'm so excited to talk to the guest I have today because my guests today are both disabled veterans suffering from service-related PTSD. Cannabis has been a lifesaver for them, both in managing their PTSD, which in turn prompted them to focus their careers on sharing that gift with as many others as they possibly could who might need it. They were awarded cannabis licenses in Massachusetts as part of the state's inaugural social equity program. Freshly baked co-founders, Philip Smith and Jenny Roseman, thanks so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel today. Hey, Montel, how you doing? Hi. Thanks for having us. Thanks no, so absolutely. Much. Thank you so much for being here. I mean, it's uh, it's great to have you guys. You know, let, let's back up a little bit and give people a little bit of int- uh, information about your backgrounds. Um, let's start talking a little bit about your military career. Jenny, I'm going to start with you. Um, yeah, let's start with you. What, what, what took you on a path to become an Air Force medic, right? Tell me a little bit about your service. Correct. I actually, not sure how I got here, but I signed on that dotted line when I was only 16 years old. And I right. left when I was 18. Delayed entry program? I did. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I was ready. Um, and uh, I served at Andrews Air Force Base in BC for most of my time in service, where on 9 11, I was a first responder at the Pentagon. Wow, and that's what help help uh, set in some of that PTSD that you have, right? Yes, sir. Did you ever have anybody in your family um, serve in the military before you? I had some grandfathers, but no one I had ever met. I'm not sure exactly where my heart turned it on, but I was just kind of called to serve. Gotcha, Philip. How about you? Now you were a uh, in the Marine Corps. I also served in the Marine Corps and the Navy, but I was in the Marine Corps. You were a uh, sergeant in the Marine Corps, right? That's right. Semper Fi, Montel. Semper Fi, absolutely. I, I I made it to I made it to O four and E four in both. You know, I was a E four in the Marine Corps and O four in, in the Navy. Um, what? Uh, tell me a little bit about your career. Where? When? When? And how did it start? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I. So let me just start with you know my father is a veteran as well, uh, Vietnam era. Uh, my grandfather is actually a Montford Pointer. Um, mm-hmm. And you're familiar with the Montford Pointers, um, sure. one of the first African American Marines to serve. You know, they had to serve in Montford Point. They couldn't serve mm-hmm. in Barrack Island because of segregation. Um, mm-hmm. So I do have kind of a lineage. So, um, you know, growing up, you know, the one thing that really didn't happen in my house, though, was that my father really didn't talk about the military. Because as you know, Vietnam was tough. You know, even my dad, who didn't serve in country, came home. He wasn't treated the greatest. So um, when I got into high school, uh, I did a, a little bit of, uh, I was a basketball player, actually. And I went to a, a, a community college over here and I just felt like I needed something. You know, I had some friends that had gone away and I just said, you know, I just I just I feel like I need something. So I went to the recruiter and literally two weeks later, I left, I signed up for the Marine Corps and I was gone. Um, Where'd you go to boot camp? I went to Paris Island. There you go. Real, real. Stanfley <laughs> Marine, not a. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's where I went also. And I, I'm also a Vietnam air vet. So go ahead. Though. Yep. And thank you thank for your you service. For your service. Absolutely. Uh, so um, after boot camp, I ended up going out to California and I became, you know, I ended up getting E5 in three years, which was pretty good for the Marine Corps. You know, I was, yes. uh, yeah, it was pretty good for the Marine Corps. I was definitely good to go. Um, in 2003, I ended up uh, going overseas to Iraq. I was a uh, radio operator with the infantry, uh, first Marines, first Marine Division. 2800? Uh, excuse me? 2800? Uh, 06, no, excuse me. Okay, got it. That's right. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. No, no, no. I, I was just, I just, just want to listen to know. I was just throwing out one of those. I, I think it was 2531 when you were in, but um, oh, yeah. mine was 06 something. I don't know. It's tough. Uh, yeah. But, <laughs> but, um, uh, served uh, in the Marine Corps. I went to Iraq in 2003. When I came home, uh, I started a construction company with my father. I had a family, so I got out. And, you know, things were tough, though. They weren't great. Um, you know, I was barely holding on. It took me about six years to finally even get to the VA finally get some help, which I did. And the therapy is great. And I recommend it to anyone getting help on, you know, I'm sure you would too, Montel. You know, whether we know we need it or not, I, I just feel like the VA is there and the help is there. Like, you know, go get it. Um, the medications weren't so great for me. Um, so throughout the years, I've, you know, I've struggled, um, you know, same thing with Jenny and, you know, 2018, we met and it was a tough time in my life. And it was about the, about around the time where I finally embraced cannabis as a medicine. Um, you know, I enjoyed it recreationally throughout the years, but it, but everyone was telling me that it wasn't working. Um, you know, I even told the VA and my doctors to their credit, 
you know, at least listened to me, but, you know, didn't, you know, encourage it, obviously. Um, but when I finally embraced it as a medicine, I feel like that's when it changed my life. And, you know, 2018 is when I met Jenny. And then, you know, that's kind of how Freshly Baked was born. Well, let's back up again. I'm sorry to do this. I, I, I hate to take you both through, you know, the trauma of your life. But, you know, let, let's start with you again, Philip. I mean, you were in Iraq, you said? Yeah, but I was so, I mean, yeah, So, I mean, what, what were some of the things that, that you faced and some of the memories that helped or that, that trigger your PTSD? Sure. So um, just to start with, um, you know, you know, you know, staying with the cannabis, you know, falling asleep isn't an issue. It's staying asleep. And a lot of the dreams and recollections that I have, you know, especially, um, you know, you know, bodies, you know, I feel like humans aren't meant to see those things. Um, especially a lot of, you know, children, things like that. You know, those are the things that always run through my mind, especially when I got home or those near chances where, you know, this could have been the day or like this is going to be the day. You know, that firefight was, you know, maybe the next one will be the last one. Um, mm -hmm. I had a few folks that I served with that um, were wounded, but nobody, you know, everyone came home. Thank God. Um, I was a sergeant, so I had about 30 Marines under me and everyone came home. Um, but, you know, the images and, you know, and I won't get into too many details about, you know, certain things that happen, these split decisions that sometimes they never leave you. Um, you know, you always think about these things. So those are some of the things that, you know, have, have, have gotten to me over the years. And they haunt you at night. Yeah, especially at night, you know, when the mind, you know, when the mind slows down and there's not much to think about, you know, sometimes your mind can wander into those places. And, you know, other triggers, you know, for me throughout the years have been crowded places, you know, fireworks, you know, these things throughout the years. And even now, you know, it, it's not, you know, 100% for me, you know, PTSD is something that you're always, you know, managing. And that's what cannabis does. Cannabis helps me manage it. So I can still definitely um, be triggered by, you know, things. I mean, you know, Jenny and I are very particular on where we go and what we do. You know, even this right here, this is pretty big for us. This is, this right. is a big deal for us to be doing this right now. And it wasn't okay. like we were like, and I love you, Montel. I remember <laughs> from you from the kid. I mean, you're one of the more famous Marines, but, you know, coming on here, something like this, you know, people probably have normal anxiety, but for us, it's, it's a it's a lot worse. It's a lot heightened. So, um, you know, you know, you know, cannabis is something that helps us do things like this, helped us, you know, create this business and, and lead wonderful people. You know, it definitely keeps us, you know, grounded, per se, when it comes to, you know, what we can and can't do. And, and we're very honest in what we can and can't do. Um, and the things that we can't do, we have good folks around us to help us. And Jenny, how about you? I mean, again, you saw the devastation of 9-11, you weren't in the Pentagon when the plane actually hit, but you ended up having to go over to act as a first responder. Are those images and issues that, that haunt you at night also? I would say any of the medics and any of our armed forces, the docs in the Marine Corps, I mean, we have a tough job. And I was on a triage team, basically preparing for years for mass casualties and trying to you know, who can I save? Who I've, I've done multiple deployments, one with shock trauma right in D.C., where, you know, they're constantly in a prepared state of this is what could happen. So when it did happen, it was kind of like you were ready and in the moment you were ready to perform and you did. But then after you realized how big that is and what a big deal it was and what you've gone through and that kind of plays into now. You know, being able to leave the house, take a plane somewhere, um, any kind of crowd that I go into, a football game, which I love. I'm just looking around like, will this be the next giant event? And who do I save first? How can I be helpful? Will I be enough? It's it's a lot of that. And it's a lot of the rest of your life judging things by life or death, even if it's not. So Cannabis definitely helps you use your wise mind and say, hey, you know, this isn't that serious. We're here. It's today. Let's check in and let's get it right. Well, now let me let me slow you down a little bit because we, both of you, Philip, you jumped right to it and said, you know, well, I found cannabis. But, okay, now you were in the Marine Corps. You leave Iraq. You come back home. You're not using cannabis while you're on active duty, correct? All right. So then when you transition out, tell me a little bit about your transition out of the service. Yeah. So. When I got out, um, and I think all veterans can feel this, and, we, and Jenny kind of talked about this, you're doing some pretty big things when you're in the military at a young age. I mean, I made sergeant at 21 years old. I mean, we have kids out there that are leading our troops into battle. Like, they're kids leading kids. Like, we're all kids out there. 
So when you get home, it's hard to transition into the civilian world to find something that is going to give you that same worth. And I definitely felt that when I got out. And I started a construction company with my father, and he's still in business today. It's small, family owned. And, um, you know, that was tough on its own. You know, you know, dealing with customers, having PTSD and trying to keep calm, like, you know, little things were setting me off. I mean, I was not in a good place. And my father, God bless him, you know, he was very patient with me and, and, and helped me, but I wasn't really open either. You know, I mean, you, were you able to talk to him about it or talk to anybody about it? No, no. I wasn't I, I was talking to anyone about anything. At the time, um, my ex-wife now, I mean, you know, I, I remember breaking down on the bathroom floor with her finally. After one night, I'm going out with an old friend of mine drinking just out of the blue. I remember. I don't remember everything I said, but it was a lot. And it was shortly after that I realized that I really needed to go get help. So um, I ended up going to the VA. Um, it took me like three times to actually get into um, like the office. Like I went to the parking lot. I kind of left, made an appointment. I remember going into the lobby. It was like, nope, left. You know, I find, And then the third time I finally like got in there. And, and, and during this time, alcohol was what you kind of turn to, right? Definitely, definitely. Um, alcohol. Um, and then, like I said, you know, recreationally, I was using cannabis. I didn't really understand what it was doing or if it was helping me because everyone said it was wrong. But it was something that um, that definitely was helping me. So um, I definitely got away from the alcohol, uh, which was a good thing. Um, I never wanted to take any of the pills that the VA was giving me um, because the side effects of those were just too great. Um, and then, like, a lot of times when you're on that medication, there's no ups and downs. Like you're very much in the middle. Like you're not feeling much at all. And, you know, you still want to be able to feel like I still wanted to be able to feel happiness, you know, and sadness, just not on an extreme level like I was. So um, after going to the VA and the therapy, that definitely helped. And then it wasn't until, you know, years and years later, you know, I ended up working at the VA for a while, too. And that helped me, too, actually, and and hurt me because, you know, you know, being at the VA, talking to a lot of the older vets helped me out a lot, the Vietnam era guys. Um, but then the younger guys that were in the hospital when I was in maintenance, they would come to talk to me and then that could ruin my whole my whole week. I mean, I remember crying in my boss's office one day and he was an Air Force vet. And I think and he thought I was a tough guy, a Marine. And, and I mean, I am, but I mean, I'm a man, I'm a human. And it was a tough day. And I went in there and I really kind of, you know, laid it out how I was feeling to him. And I think that helped him understand me more, too. Because, you know, even today, there's a lot of days that I don't want to get out of bed even today. I mean, I'm forcing myself to, you know, to do these things. This is, you know, it's not easy. You know, I, you know, Jenny and I talk about this a lot. It's like having a cinder block on your back. Like, we can do everything and don't tell me I can't do it because I'll get it done. But I need to do it my way. And it might not be as fast as you can do it, but it will get done. If this is a mission, it will be completed. So I worked at the VA for a bit. And then, like I said, uh, in 2018, I had, I had a rough patch from the VA to 2018. Um, Mentally, it was it was some tough years. I've had my up and downs. But around the time that I met Jenny, um, she really lifted me out of a dark place. And that was around the time that I was like, you know what? I'm going to embrace cannabis as a medicine because I feel like it's helping me. And it was. Helping and, me. I always and you had been out of the service about how long at this point? When did you get out? Oh, well, geez, I got out in 2004. So, you know, 15 plus. So it was it was it was a while. It took me that long. Um, yeah. That long to kind of you know come around to. And Jenny, how about you? When did you get out? I, I actually did a program at Palace Chase and I did three years active and then owed the National Guard some time. So I came up here and served in Rhode Island and I served until 2004. 2004. And then here's 2004, you're out and that's almost the same time that Philip got out. And um, the two of you went on your separate, you were on your separate paths. You didn't know each other. We did and not. what was your experience like? Now you're out and now... You know, you're trying to deal with and cope with the memories that you have and try to move on in life. What, what was your transition to get the two of you, tell the two of you met? Wow, that was a lot of things. Uh, looking back, I think it was making a lot of decisions based on not sharing with everyone what exactly I was dealing with. Um, had I opened up earlier, maybe I would have made some different decisions. Not all bad. Professionally, I've been quite successful and I've led a very happy life. But taking as much time as I did to open up to others or admit that I was struggling when I wanted to be pretty tough, th those were some hard times. And then eventually it's the breakdown that I think, you know, everybody gets to at some point for some reason. And that was reaching out for help. 
And I had never had any experience with cannabis when I did go to the VA to get help. I was very much a rule follower and I felt like I was doing my best job by following rules. Uh, and I tried all of the medications from the VA. Some helped, some didn't, some helped for a bit. Uh, I had a very, you know, a long relationship with taking some, not taking some, trying it on my own. And eventually cannabis came into play shortly before I met Phil. And it really changed everything in that moment. It's, it's almost like the, the therapy or all the work that you're doing in your brain can kind of be connected. And all of a sudden it makes sense. Well, well, help explain that to those out there who are veterans who, you know, I mean, this is this is something that's, you know, systemic in our veteran community. You know, um, I hear it over and over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, I work on a program that is, you know, now known as one of the only cures for PTSD in existence. It's different than the, you know, the exposure therapy that they teach you at the VA. It's something that's called um, RTM, which is remittance of traumatic memories. And we, we're now working very hard to get this into the VA and to get this and have, have, so make it so that veterans can have access to it. But that's a psychological program. It's a program that, you know, helps you clear most of your symptoms of, of PTSD. And it does work. It works in five to 10 hours. There's no if or the buts. I'll, let, I'll get you some information about that once we're done. But for other veterans that are out there that are still wallowing, you know, they'll fill up, you touched on it. You know, I think a lot of veterans find the bottle uh, to be one of their first friends um, and don't even recognize how deleterious that is to their dealing with PTSD to begin with. So I'll ask the both of you this. I mean, like Philip, you said uh, you, had, you had dabbled in, in cannabis before a little bit. And you were doing it recreationally, but what was that epiphany moment like when you realized, hey, you know what, this really does help me? I think one of the things a lot of people don't understand about cannabis is that THC is known to interrupt the dream cycle. I think a lot of people, we want to get down to the mechanics of it. Though you can still dream, it interrupts those dreams so that they are a not as vivid or in some ways more vivid, but they are expanded upon. So you wouldn't sit there and wallow in on just a moment of looking at one body. Um, there are some people who utilize cannabis and it literally shuts down the dream uh, or the memory of the dream in a way so that you don't wake up in the middle of a dream haunted by what you just thought about. What was that aha moment for you, Philip, when you realized, wait a minute, this is starting to help me differently than I thought it was. Yeah, so um, to that point, Montel, it's for me, it was being able to stay asleep and not dreaming. And that's how it is now, like before we go to bed. And that's how we started making the gummies. So so we wouldn't uh, be smoking at night. We were like, we need something that we can dose ourselves with. And we started making these in our kitchen. That's how this kind of was born. Um, and that's exactly what it does for me. Um, it, does, it keeps, I can stay asleep. I don't wake up with any dream. I don't dream at all when I have cannabis. In, in, in. Um, when I don't have THC, I definitely will dream. Or and I'll wake up and I won't be able to go back to sleep. Um, you know, and it's not just like military things, but you know, because you know, I'm just a lot more heightened to things. It's everyday life things can be really difficult for me to deal with that, you know, sure. I'm like thinking about. So, you know, that's what the that's what cannabis does for me. And then um when it came to like going in public places, you know, not being so stressed and having the anxiety to get out the house. Um, you know, like I said, you know, there were you know, when I, you know, I used to go to fireworks, you know, all the time, my uncle used to have these fireworks shows and I would go and it would be awful for me. And no one ever knew. No one ever knew how bad it was for me, but the family wanted to go. So I went, but it was horrible. Um, when I was on cannabis again, it would, it just wasn't that bad. It wasn't so jerky. It wasn't so what's going on. It just could, could relax me. And that's how I felt like I was before the trauma. I felt like I was very much more a relaxed person and not on guard so much. And was it an epiphany when you recognize, oh, wow, wait a minute, the reason why I'm not getting so riled up is because of smoking. Yeah, I don't think it was like a boom one time. I think it was a body of work throughout the years and focusing on the medication at the VA and wondering why it wasn't working. And then when I was smoking, thinking about it, and I think it just kind of like, finally I remember in like, it was kind of like the end of 2017 and things were, were, were rough for me then. And I had stopped smoking for a bit completely stopped and 
went back to the VA, got these pills, and I was like, what is going on? I was like, I felt like everything was okay when I was smoking. Everyone's telling me that it's not, but I felt like I felt okay. And I was had to had this kind of like this battle back and forth with myself on like, okay, when you are when you, when you do have THC in you, is it you or is it not you? Like, is it you or is it? Like everyone's telling you that it's not, but is it you or is it not? And I finally was like, that is me. That's how I want to feel. I know what alcohol did to me, like physically too, immensely. So I knew that wasn't the same. So it was kind of like that body of work to get there to be like, okay, like I'm gonna go back, and I did, and, and I haven't, and I haven't gone back since. And how about you, Jenny? Was it the same kind of thing? I mean, no, you you said that you did not utilize cannabis at all, and then all of a sudden, what was that first experience like, and how did you get started? I started very low and slow with edibles from a friend. Um, I didn't feel like I got the big effect that everyone had been talking about initially at the beginning until flower. And then it was like that day basically changed my life. And I was like, this plant is magical. Yeah. In what way? In what way? Explain it. Cause again, I've got, got, got a lot of veterans that, that watch this podcast and you know, they need to be kind of just, you know, filled with the information that they need to be able to say, Oh, you know, that's kind of like me. So when you said, when you tried flower for the first time, you went, oh, that's it. What? what? How was that experience? Explain that to me. Um, I have trouble with my memory with PTSD. That's a big one for me. I have the bad things super close that you can see, like you talked about, but, but the other stuff kind of goes away. And flower made it all kind of come back, like almost like your brain is reconnecting the way it did before trauma. So it's almost like getting all of those good feelings and good vibes and all of the good stuff where you remember what it's like to feel everything again or remember things in not a scary way. And then when I realized taking it before going to sleep wouldn't make me immediately, every time I fell asleep, I would first feel like I was falling down a huge hole and I would wake myself up and I needed the TV on and I was torturing myself and not falling asleep until three in the morning and getting up and just go, 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 because it's easier to go than to think about all of the things. And cannabis changed all of that. It helped me slow down and sort things out and the anxiety behind everything becoming a 10 wasn't a 10 anymore. It was there and I could feel it, but I could more easily process it in a way of someone who was wise to what was going on, if that makes sense. It does. It does. And, you know, now, I mean, so, again, the two of you didn't know each other at that time, right? No. So let's talk about how you met. Sure. Well, as grownups here, being older and finding people, we found each other as veterans and we started a friendship and that friendship turned into, hey, wait a minute, this person is an amazing human, which turned into, hey, we should do this business together and we should crush it. And 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 again, when, now you, you're, you're rolling through that, leaving out a little bit of the detail. I mean, who, who suggested first, you know what? I mean, so we ought to share this knowledge that we have gained with others. Who who came up with that idea? So I, we, were, we were, honestly, we were just smoking on the couch in 2018 together, enjoying each other. I love this woman very much. And... Um, we started talking about how, and this is something that we bonded on, you know, how cannabis was helping us. And it was during one of those conversations that we said, you know, maybe we have something here. So, you know, we had some gummies that we had made for us to go to sleep, but we had a woman living next door that was having serious um, pain in her head and she couldn't sleep as well. And we gave her some and, it, and that literally changed her life. Mm-hmm. That woman was like, oh my God, this is crazy. She had never you know, even thought about trying cannabis. So we were like, whoa. Like there's other people that, that can be helped by this. And we started giving them to friends and family and other veterans that we're obviously friends with. And everyone was like, like, these are helping me. Like, this is what you guys have been doing. We're like, yeah, like this is serious. They were like, wow, like you guys have something here. So for us, you know, access was important. So we started Freshly Baked to bring access to the plant and to talk. Like to, every time we talk, we feel like we're opening doors for another veteran to at least have access to try this. It's not going to work for everybody. And I want that to be clear. Just like the VA, like those pills, some of those pills are working just fine for folks and that's okay. But having the option and the access to try it, that's what we need. 
But you know, now I mean, it's it's one thing to have a conversation on the couch. It's another thing to start writing up, pay, filling out the paperwork, and trying to pursue a license. So let's go through that as process. So how long did it take you to apply, and and what was that whole process like for the two of you? Well, before we go into the serious part of this, I'd like to say that Bill is quite humble. And he had been looking at these regulations and waiting for this to become an industry that he could be a part of for some time. So definitely his marine foresight there. Um, after that, you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, she's right. I mean, it wasn't like I was just like, hey, like today we're going to do this. I mean, it's something that I always told myself, like that would be something I would love to get into. Um, at the time, it wasn't it wasn't uh, motivated by, you know, PTSD and access, but like it was like. That's really what the motivation was behind it. Listen, some people say this is nearly impossible, and it damn well is. I mean, especially for a black-owned, female-owned, small social equity company like we are. I mean, funding is nearly impossible for everyone. You just imagine what it's like for us. So it, it took a lot of work to try to get here. It took us three years to actually get operational. That's how long the whole process took, um, not just because there's a lot of red tape, you know, not only in the state, but we had to lobby local municipalities. Um, the local side took a little bit longer. Uh, but we've been supported here. So um, it definitely wasn't easy. I would say mm -hmm. too, um, the, we, the moment where it kind of became super real for us was Phil had found this fancy lawyer that we still use up in Boston. It was fancy to us. And we went up there for the day, which is very difficult um, for me to do to go up to Boston. And we were in this big fancy building on this high, high floor. And I took a picture out the window and we sat down and we were like, we're going to have a meeting and see if this can really happen. And we talked to them for quite some time. And at the end, we were like, you know, so when is there a no? And the lawyer was like, there is no no. They, they just come back and they say, you have to change this. And we looked at each other and we were like, wait, this isn't like the government. Like, you, you can just keep trying. They're not just going to say no. And they were like, yeah, they were like, whatever you want to do. And we went home that day and we were like, this is it, we're, we can do this. And you were able to apply for a social equity uh, license. Talk a little bit about that for a minute. Yeah, the Ma so Massachusetts has the first state approved social equity program in the country. I was part of the first cohort in the entrepreneur track. And the social equity program, uh, there's three criteria. One, um, you have a conviction uh, or been arrested for cannabis. Uh, two, you have a parent um, that's been arrested. Um, and three, if you have lived in a city deemed a area of disproportionate impact by the state um, for marijuana. Um, and I qualify for two of those. I come from Taunton, Massachusetts, which is a disproportionately impacted community um, for, by the war on drugs. And I was also arrested before I went to the Marine Corps. At 17, I was arrested here. I'm in a vehicle with myself and three other people that weren't African-American. And I was the one that got arrested. Um, it almost derailed my whole military career, um, but it didn't, thank God. Um, but it did help stop me from getting into um, law enforcement. Because it's funny, I'm in cannabis now, but when I got out, I really, you know, I still was kind of much structured like a Marine. So I looked into law enforcement, which was funny because I would have I would have had no business being a police officer the way I was suffering from PTSD. No way in hell. Um, so thank God that didn't happen. Um, so um, the first co so the cohort, they also gave me 14 classes all uh, centered around business and the cannabis industry from taxes to um, business plans to um, you know manufacturing cultivation a little bit of everything um, and then after that uh, you know they have a social equity fund that they're still working on hopefully that will get up and going soon and folks can start um, getting some uh, some capital to get their business up and going but the uh, the social equity program was great it also allowed us to be the first recreational uh, delivery company on the East Coast freshly baked um, being a 51% owned company by a social equity applicant, um, you can qualify for that license. So we did. So right now we're the only, well, there's two other companies, but we're the only one that um, can deliver its own products vertically integrated. Um, so we're the first, you know, online dispensary, if you would, too, as well. So you could deliver not only your own products, but other people's products, too, correct? So so there's, a, so there's some red tape there. So our license is called a delivery endorsement. So it doesn't allow us to buy finished product from other manufacturers, but we can buy bulk. So we have flour on our menu. It doesn't come packaged um, because we can process the flour. So we, we bring it in bulk and then my people, our people uh, package it up and then we put that on our menu. Uh, the same thing with all our edibles. Uh, we can't uh, buy edibles packaged, but everything that we can produce 
we can sell. So all our edibles are also produced for ourselves, our dabs. We can buy a distillate wholesale and bring that in in bulk, and then we can package that up as dabs and shatter and whatnot. So anything that we can produce, we can sell. That's really, that's really, really interesting. That's a, that's a different than a lot of other states. And that's one of the problems with this industry is that every state has got a different format for doing it. Um, how has your company impacted your community? Well, we actually work with the VFW pretty closely here. Um, in Massachusetts, you have to have a positive impact plan to get a license. And part of that for us was um, hiring uh, extremely diverse um, LGBTQ+. Plus, uh, veterans, um, that's pretty much what we're made up in females. Um, that's pretty much what our company is right now. Um, and then with the VFW, uh, volunteer work, uh, donating uh, monetary donations to the VFW, um, supporting them, you know, trying to reach out to folks in our community. We have another, we have a few other local um, places that we want to work with. If we had more capital and money, um, volunteer work too is tough because, you know, we, I mean, there's a lot going on. Even a day for a small company without capital can be devastating. So, uh, we try to balance um, our uh, monetary donations when we have it with our with our um, volunteer work. So um, it's it's super important to us. And as freshly baked grows, you know those those initiatives will grow as well. So right now you have your own brand of products that you actually produce and put in the marketplace, right? Yep, freshly baked company. It's the hottest brand in Massachusetts right now. That Moon Man. Where is he? Right? He's somewhere. <laughs> there. He's flying around all over. We're half the dispensaries in the state. Um, which is great. Uh, we just hit a million dollars in revenue last month, which is outstanding. Um, we've only been operational for about eight months, so we are doing well. We'd be doing a lot better if we had more capital, if we were highly funded, like a lot of the big operators here. I mean, you know, we could scale the business a lot faster, but we're bootstrapping it and and, and we're doing well. And like I said, the first recreational home delivery company on the East Coast, which was huge. I mean, that was a huge accomplishment. That's something that we wanted to accomplish and we got it done. And, uh, you know, Southern Massachusetts, people are enjoying that product right to their doors. And, and and what's what's next? I mean, what what's the future look like? It's what, what kind of goals do you have for the future of the business? Oh my goodness, so many. Um, we're fortunate enough with our license type where social consumption will be on the table eventually, where we could set up a cafe or a restaurant where people can go and partake. Um, just us. I mean, we we honestly we're two disabled veterans running a pretty large company. I would love to be able to spread the joy of what we have created here and open up more jobs to our community and find more interesting ways to give back to our community and work with more people. It's, it's all about getting there and getting the money to begin with. Yep, we have, um, we have, uh, we actually have, a uh, under the micro license, there are many things you can do. You can cultivate, which we have a cultivation license and we have a space. We're gonna start raising money for that soon. Um, so we do have that license. We have a manufacturing license up and going. We have our home delivery license up and going. Jenny mentioned the social consumption license, which is hot right now, like in LA. Um, that's something that's going to be starting here soon, which we can exclusively do just like home delivery. But we're also in New York State right now. I reached out to the Cannabis Control Board there. I'm trying to give them my feedback on the social equity program and how that could relate to New York so they can kind of get it right. I think Massachusetts, um, the CCC did a great job, but it's always can be done better. And I think that's what they're hoping for. So we're also in New York State and we're hoping to spread the freshly baked brand there. We're actually in a lot of dispensaries on the border of New York and Massachusetts. So like the, the freshly baked brand in Moon Man is already in New York. A lot of people come over to get it. So it just seemed like it was the, the next step. Yeah, now, I mean, and, but now if you do open in New York, you're going to have to do all production in New York for New York sales, right, supposedly? Yep, yep. It will just be a manufacturing facility, and that would be just for New York until it's federally illegal. Like, you know, Montel, we can't cross any borders. So that would just, that would just be for New York. So that would just be manufacturing over there. And we have a lot of partners that are there that, that, that also operate here in Mass. A lot of larger dispensaries that that, that, that are looking for us. Large dispensaries looking for your product on their shelves. Yes, definitely. You have a lot of the, a lot of larger companies who are here, multi-state operators. I mean, we'll be a, we'll be a multi-state operator. It's crazy to say that yeah. if we open up there, we'd be a multi-state operator because we are still just a small mom and pop. Um, I mean, but, we we are at the end of the day two disabled veterans that decided to to make this crazy company. And I think people can respect and understand how difficult it is and appreciate where we came from and who we are when we're asking them, you know, and, and along this journey, there have been some bumps and there have been a lot of these other companies who have supported us. And when we've reached out and asked for help, whether that's, you know, hey, you know, we're trying to get rid of these gummies, we're trying to do big things. 
people are happy to help and we're happy to help them back. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, you're in a good position to talk about what do you think the future holds for our industry? I mean, I, you, you know, you just said hopefully there'll be some sort of federal legislation. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, and I also believe that, you know, I was just having a conversation earlier today with someone who's I'm, I'm working with in the industry also. And we we're just talking about the fact that, you know, we are in an industry right now that's trying its best to shoot itself in its own foot. I mean, we, we got a lot of players that are, you know, shooting off the nose in spite of their face. <coughs> I'm talking about when it comes to things like creating these, they're not synthetic, but they are derivative cannabinoids from THC-8 to THC-O to HHC. You know, and the more and more of this garbage that hits the marketplace, you know, rather than think this is going to be a way to expand our industry, I think this is going to give those who wanted to have an excuse to come down on our heads good reason to do so. What do you guys think about that? So I think when it comes to federal legalization, um, I think that we will see it sooner. We will see it sooner than later. Right, and why, just I, I, I'm going to be naysayer here for a second, but why? You know, you have a president in office currently who still believes cannabis is a gateway drug. You have a vice president who made sure that more people were arrested for non-cannabis, for non-violent cannabis law violations in her state before she became president. Um, they, two, both of them promised over and over again during the election cycle that they would do something about cannabis in the first hundred days. Duh. And you know, I, uh, until Uday and Kuse get an opportunity to put their hands in his business, I don't think you can ever rely on Donald Trump. So why do you think that the Fed's going to do something? And even take a look at McConnell. McConnell, who pushed as hard as he could to make sure his state of Kentucky got hemp right, they have been 100% against THC and cannabis. So I, I just wonder, wh where does this thought process come from? Yeah, I think um, I think you're correct on everything you said there. Um, but it's a, it's like a snowball that keeps rolling. Every election, more states are hopping on board, and that means more money is involved. And at the end of the day, all these folks care about is money. You're seeing a lot of ex, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of a lot of um, politicians that are getting out of politics and getting into cannabis industry. I think that's you know that's for a reason. So at the end of the day, um, if the money's there, then it will come. Whether it's Democrats or whether it's Republicans, at the end of the day, it's about the money and. And, and it's there for them at those higher levels and those bigger companies. I mean, it is there for them. And that's why they're getting involved. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow or maybe even this administration. But I think maybe within the next two administrations, you know, I know less than 10 years ago, I was telling people that it would be legal here in Massachusetts. And people said I was crazy. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, it was like, boom, it's on the ballot and it's here. Um, so I think it's really, really interesting. I mean, from your lips to God's ears, I hope he's listening. And that's exactly what happens. You know, uh, um, at the same time, but, but you know, I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to add this. I think that I'm also not for federal legalization unless equity is at the forefront of that conversation. Which that is, is not going to happen. And it, right. And, it, and it's probably not going to happen. Right. So, you know, let me just get my position clear there, though. Like, I feel like equity needs to be heavily involved in the discussion. And so, and I, I kind of like look at it as. Which, which drives me a little nuts is the fact that right now we're up to 35, 37 states, I think, in the District of Columbia have a legal cannabis law. Whenever this nation has had that many states agree with anything, it already moves the needle federally. This one has not moved the needle federally yet. We're going to get another three or four states here in the midterms. I, will it move the needle federally? Hmm. And I think just as we see the fighting and infighting that we have right now in this particular legislative body, when we move to one that's more Republican controlled, I think there'll still be the same amount of infighting. You know, you, we've got states across the country that pass cannabis laws that are trying to repeal them, trying to push to get them off the books. It's like going against the will of the people. I, I'm, I'm hearing you and I'm, I'm telling you, my brother, I, I uh, you know, I'm trying to stay positive, my man, but you know, it's like I fight this battle every day and it, it just drives me nuts that, you know, you're right. you got Boehner jumping in and jumping on board. You've got several other politicians who have gotten out of office and jump on boards of medical cannabis company and other cannabis companies. 
but then don't do a damn thing for anybody outside of their own little fiefdom. That's part of the problem, I think, with this industry. We are so caught up in, I don't know, trying to maintain our own little footprint and could care less about the bigger picture. You know, MJ Biz is going on right now. And, you know, I, I bet if you went out to MJ Biz, you walk on the floors, it's all B2B, an industry that should right now be concerning itself more from B2C. to consumer. They're all out there trying to figure out how they can sell a new widget or a new box or a new something, which is really ignorant, you know, and until this industry stops fighting with each other. And I'm glad to hear you said that you had other members, other people in other other organizations and other companies in the industry that were supportive of you. That's really good to hear. Yeah, that's something we do, too, Montel, here. Um, you know, we're all about reaching out and, and bringing folks with us. And we have a lot of partners that we're working with right now that don't have licenses in the cannabis space. but. Maybe we're doing something at home and they wanted to get into the space like mom and pops. We have a you know a woman in her 70s, Kathleen Belici, that wants to make biscotti. We're helping her out. I've offered it to everybody. We have another gentleman that we're bringing on to do a vape line that has been doing them kind of in the gray market. Like, And, you know, this it's, it's very tough to get into. So trying to help folks get in um, and giving them a little more than what we had. Because, again, you're right. Like, like we have good partners, but there's a lot of lip service out there, too. Oh. You know, we've gotten a lot of lip service from people that I was like, wow. Like when I was struggling, calling up, begging, like, and just being like, no, we don't want to help you. Like, you can't buy a box of five hundred dollars worth of these gummies just to help me out. To get nope, can't do it. So when it, a lot of times when it comes to business, it is straight and cut and dry, and we're not like that at first. Big anyone that wants a chance, like we're willing to work with you, bring you in, help you build up your brand. I'm not trying to control people. Um, you know, we're really trying to support the culture. Um, and I and I do still wish that a lot of bigger companies. And we do have some good partners, don't get me wrong, but there's still a lot of larger companies that, you know, that, that don't want to mess with us for whatever reason. Like we've been on shelves of companies and our gummies, one second best seller in the store out of all edible, edibles. And they go, huh, we can make our own gummy. Now uh, you guys are gone. We're going to start making our own gummy and kick us right off that shelf and start making their own gummy. Now they sound like, oh, no, but at least they're keeping all the profits and that's how they look at it. So that stuff is still going on. So you're right. I'm hoping that we can get past all that. And and we've never been to one to knock down the big boys. I feel like we all need to work together, but we need to work together and be honest too, especially about equity and what that means. Because a lot of these big folks, you know, scream equity and they're doing things around equity. But when an equity company, and there aren't many of us in Massachusetts that are operational, or even in the country, when Freshly Baked reaches out and we're like, you know, we're an equity company. Can you can you take our products? And they say no. Then you're not for equity, and, and we get right. no. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying that's exactly what we get a lot of the, the lip service. We want to support equity when an actual equity company. And again, there aren't many of us, so when you get caught off guard and one actually reaches out, it's like, ah, wait a second. Oh, we actually have to help them now. A Got lot it. of times, it's it's a no. So yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy, but you know, hopefully these things will start to change here in the next. You know, so put your crystal ball on. What do you think is going to happen in the next year, next two? So I don't know about federally. We've kind of addressed that. We'll see what happens there. But I can speak to Massachusetts. Right now, um, on the equity side, we have the delivery operators all coming online. And they're all equity applicants. They're females. They're veterans. They're minority owned. I'm going to throw this out there right now. There are some amazing, young, especially African-American leaders of these companies right now that need capital and need help. They don't have friends to reach out to. They don't have big venture capital firms. You know, how many times have we been turned down? We stopped talking to VCs because either they wanted the whole company or they didn't think that we could get the job done. And you know what? We got it done. Everything we said we were going to do, we got it done because we got a mission. We're going to complete it. So in Massachusetts, you're going to see equity and delivery start to take the forefront. Um, dispensaries won't get hit. I mean, there's plenty of for everybody. The black market is still here too. But in Massachusetts, you're going to start to see the licenses turn around. If you look on the um, portal right now, there are more, I believe, finally, more equity licenses in the queue than medical operators, which is fantastic. And that's what we wanted to get to. So you're going to start seeing more small mom and pops like us because folks like us are going to reach back with capital and we're going to start helping these guys out too and making sure the industry stays diverse. So that's what you're going to see. You're going to see more diversity in Massachusetts. That's excellent. Anything else you want to add? Uh, yes. Just thank you again, Montel. You know, just off subject here, you know, growing up, my mother loved you. Like, like, Montel was, like you were in the house, like everyone knows Montel. So when you, when you guys reached out and just, it was humbling just to know that like you knew who we were and that you were, you were willing to speak with us. So thank you. 
No, absolutely. And if people want to get more information about you, your company, where do they go? Yeah, please. You can visit freshlybakedcompany.com um, and check us out right on there. It's a wholesale page, but for delivery, you can go right on our menu and check out the menu that we have. Um, like I said, we're going to be raising money soon. We have a cultivation license. We're going to be raising money for that soon. Um, and uh, if you're interested in maybe investing in Freshly Baked, please reach out right through the uh, right through the website and, and give us a shout. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here. I wish you guys well and good luck to you. And like I told you, I'll make sure that I get you some information about the RTM program. Yes, please. Which no, is no, please. Remittance of Traumatic Memories. This is a program that is right now, I mean, literally has been touted worldwide as one of, and Prince Harry was involved in funding this. I mean, he's been, they've done research at, at Walter Reed, at uh, Harvard. New York State has utilized the the protocol for first responders. This doesn't just work for combat PTSD. It works for almost every form of PTSD that exists from childhood trauma to car accidents to you name it, sexual abuse to you name it. So, um, and it remits anywhere from 90 to 100% of the symptoms in as little as five to 10 hours. So it's an amazing program. I'll make sure I get you information about that. I hope and uh, that you both stay well. Um, you know, hug each other and hug the, the family. And, um, you know, whenever you want to come back, you always have a home here to, to sit and chat. Thank you, Montel. Thank, Thank you yeah. for all yeah. you do and your support of other veterans. We've yeah, watched you and your home remodel shows, and it's so magical to know that there's people out there reaching back and helping the rest of us. And if you want to Thank team you. up Montel with the plant, we're actually exactly. big. always love to team up with Montel. Let us know. Well, you know what? I I I'm I'm involved with the uh, I I'm in I'm involved in some ways that might be able to help you. So we'll see. Let's we want to have a conversation. That would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Okay, you guys take care and make sure you tune in for the next edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.